So this is uh, session number eight. We are compared to the, or meeting number eight, uh, compared to our outline, as you can see, we are in a very good um, position. So last time, session seven, we finished the synchronous machines, uh, the first uh, presentations, the first uh, slides. We um, completely finished this one. Today, we are going to cover, um, or we can say co continuing the uh, uh, synchronous machines, the power flow, some examples, and then we take the parallel operation of the generators, the group characteristics. Um, after that, we are going to, you know, like uh, give you some hints uh, as we did with assignment number one, but now this time is for assignment number two. For assignment number two, the, the uh, due date is next week, exactly in a week, uh, end of the day, uh, Thursday. So this is, uh, I, I know some, some of you already sent the answers for assignment number two, but you you have up to the, like, um, the day, like the due date, if you want to update something, because I want to make sure that uh, you all have like a fair for like the assignment. Today, I'm going to cover the hints. So if you want to change your, what you submitted to me, that's completely fine. Okay. And then we can, uh, try to solve some of the PO exams. Uh, this is what we usually do after in, end of the each uh, module. So today, for example, we I'm going to cover one of the exam problems for the synchronous machines. And then similar to what we did with the DC, the transformer, three-phase power, and magnetic circuits. By the way, by next time, we are going to finish the entire, uh, let's say, the PO uh, or like ent entire topics that is covered in the PO exam. Next time is the induction machines, and this is the last one in the our uh, PO exam. The last one is the optional, is the transmission lines, and we are going to uh, do it like maybe it's it's not like a big uh, presentations. It's like um, maybe one hour, and we are going to use the the two hours in the um, solving some of the PO exams and knowledge problems or, or questions. Last uh, session is the module 11 is course review. And after that, it's the final exam. So this, this is, there's no sessions for the final exam. Okay. Do you have any questions for the outline, this is what we have in the outline and we are in a very good position. Like today we are going to cover what we have in the uh, meeting number eight in the outline. We are not delayed or we didn't miss anything. Okay, if you don't have any question, I can go to the next um, Step is that uh, what we covered in the synchronous machines because we are going to use it today. So last time we covered the synchronous machines. We finished the synchronous machines. I will go very quickly on the, um, uh, certain points. And the first point is the equivalent circuit. This is the equivalent circuit for the synchronous machines. We have RA, the armature resistance, X, S or JXS, this is the synchronous uh, reactance. Okay, EA, it's the armature. V, and this V is, as you can see, in phase because the synchronous machines are always in three phase. And this one, like this equivalent circuit, is pair phase. And V phase, this is the voltage on the terminal. If you have a generator, the current will flow from E to V. If it's a motor, it's from the V to E. We have the field. It's a DC, so VF is DC. And we have the current IF. 
There is a relationship between the current IF and the E. This is similar to the VH curve, or like uh, sometimes we, say, we, we call it like the open uh, circuit voltage uh, versus the, the field current. And this one is, is a very important, um, you know, like uh, relationship between the E and IF. Yes, I can see a question. Please uh, go ahead. Hi, Professor. Uh, sorry, maybe Hello. it's a basic question, uh, but what is the concept of synchronous? I mean, we, 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 as I read the books or like I reviewed last session, we always talk about the synchronous speed, synchronous like uh, like uh, inductance. So, what what was the what's the concept of this? Yeah, yeah, this is the yeah a good question. So, what is the synchronous? Like, uh, why we call it like synchronous? Yes, synchronous. It means you are uh, synchronizing. Synchronizing. It means you are like rotating, for example, or having the your sinusoidal at a certain frequency, okay, which is constant, let's say. So it's not a changing. And this is what we have in the system. If the system is stable or and the steady state, you will have a frequency of 60 hertz. So what is the frequency 60 hertz in, in the system or the grid or the power system? It means that all the machines are rotating, okay? Uh, this is the shaft. If it's like, um, I'm here talking about like the mechanical uh, generation because we have other things now uh, coming in the system that is not using the mechanical, similar to the batteries, for example. But let's say, let's talk about the uh, synchronous uh, machines in the grid, which is the majority by the way, so most of the generation in the system by the synchronous generators. All are rotating at a constant speed, which is omega, let's say, synchronous. So they are synchronized and you have a synchronized frequency. If the frequency, let's say, if the speed of, the, of all the generators at the same time, they increased, you will have higher frequency than 60 hertz. So you need to have all the machines rotating at a certain speed. They are not equal because there is, it depends on something that we would discuss today. Uh, the equation is for the frequency of your uh, machine equals to the number of the poles times the speed in RPM over 120. So it means it depends on the number of, uh, of the poles. And then the frequency is similar to the speed in RPM. Number of the poles is um, due to something. If you have a machine, let's say this is the DC machine and you have your poles. This is two poles machine. One is the north and one is the south. When your conductor is moving from this point to this, from the, let's say the positive to the negative, you will see that the, it's like a sinusoidal. You, you, will, you will like, you start it at the positive, for example, and then you reach it to the negative. In between, you have zero, two zeros here. So one and two zeros. If you have four pools, machine this is exactly I, i'm i'm talking here about the dc but it's it has the same concept for the synchronous and if you have north and south and north and south so now you are moving from positive to negative to positive to negative so you do a couple of rotation or let's say cycles in one mechanical rotation. That's the reason we included the number of the poles here. So I know that all the machines have uh, same frequency, 60 Hertz, but based on the number of the poles, you will have a certain speed. If your machine has exactly the same number of the poles, so they should have the same speed 
to get the same frequency of the 60 Hertz. By the way, we, I'm, I'm saying 60 Hertz is because we have uh, in Canada, we have it 60 Hertz, in US 60 Hertz. Most of the countries, they have 50 Hertz. So it's a different one. I need to do something here. It's not 100% accurate. Uh, and we will discuss it today that the frequency is exactly 6 Hertz and it's always constant at 6 Hertz. In reality, because some, some like uh, its system is dynamic, loads are coming, generators are, you know, maybe like you have outage or something. So sometimes we have different, like slightly changes from the 60 Hertz and it depends on the events you have. But in normal, like in, in normal cases, you should have 60 and almost or close to constant value. Okay. So this is the, what, what we mean by uh, synchronous machines. And this is like the, or synchronous in general, uh, synchronization. It means the machines, all the machines are rotating, rotating at certain speed uh, based on the number of poles they have. At the end, you have all the system rotating at 60 Hertz and they are all synchronized. You will know the difference between or like the exact meaning of the synchronous when you study the next uh, meeting or next uh, session, the asynchronous machines. The asynchronous machines or not synchronous machines, it's the induction machines. You will find that there is a slip, there is a difference between the frequency of the grid and the frequency of the machine itself. So there is a, a kind of like difference. And this difference is like, we call it like slip. We will study this um, in details in next time. But this is the, the, the meaning that for the synchronous machines, all your machines mechanically rotating at a certain speed based on the frequency, the 60. However, induction machines or asynchronous machines, they have something different. They, they may have like a, a slip. And this slip is like there is a different frequency than what you have inside your machine and uh, compared to your system frequency. Okay. But this is a very good question. And um, now we have a lot of um, batteries in the system coming. A lot of wind uh, coming, which is using the induction machines and converters. So the system, like the definition of the frequency now is started to be, especially in, in a small system of all batteries, for example, the definition of like, um, or um, not just the definition, like trying to connect or assign the frequency to the machine and rotate and rotation of the machine and the speed of the rotation of uh, the machines are now they are slightly different. You still, you need to keep your system at 60 Hertz, but for different reasons. The, um, the main reason is that all the devices we have are designed to have like 60 Hertz. So even if you don't have machines and rotating and certain frequency, even if you have a batteries and converters, you will try to go to the same frequency because your loads are designed, all your loads are designed to have the 60 Hertz or 50 Hertz if you have. And some, by the way, some of the devices can, um, you know, work on both like 60 and 50 Hertz, both, uh, but not all the devices. Certain devices, they have, they can um, sense the frequency and they can work you know, on both frequencies. Okay. So we use the concept of synchronous when we see the machine in the grid. So it means that still if we rotate, for example, the generator less than a synchronous speed, we produce voltage, we, we produce like energy but we cannot connect it to the grid because of this concept, right? Uh, yes, and you have to increase, for example, the speed until you reach to, uh, until you can do what we call it like synchronization. You connect to your grid to the mm -hmm. 60. Let's say if you have a machine and it's rotating, but uh, slower speed, like 55 Hertz, you cannot connect this machine to the grid. You have to increase the speed up to 60 and then connect to the grid. 
So one of the conditions to connect to the grid is to rotate exactly similar to what we have in the uh, system. Otherwise, what, what is like the, um, uh, maybe like consequences after connecting something like 50, this one is like as if you are doing a short circuit. So a lot, like current will be extremely high and you will damage all the windings and everything for your um, generator, for this generator. So you have to go to like uh, 60 Hertz. And this is the synchronization. Let's say this is your grid, A, B, and C. And this is your machine, let's say in capital A and B and C. And they are both rotating. You want to, ha to have this point exactly at this point. And B with B and C with, with the C before you connect to the switch. And the frequency is the rotation. So if this one is rotating faster or slower, you will not be able to reach to the to the, the same points are connected to, you know, like each of them. So you need to make this one rotating exactly similar to what the machine, or let's say like the, the grid, if you have a, a big grid or system. So you have the exactly the same speed. So now you can connect them without any having any short circuit. Otherwise, if you have your, your, your system is they having a difference in the rotation, you will have a, a different in the phase. This one will be like here and this rotating. So you, it, there will be like a voltage difference between both of them. And this one will break, for example, the breaker. Okay, or like damage your breaker, or if uh, the breaker is okay and it can be withstand this, it will break your um, windings. The current will be extremely high. Okay. This is, of course, like a very uh, good question. And we will discuss uh, something today related to this. And next time, next meeting, we are going to discuss the induction to see something completely different than the synchronous machine. Hopefully it's uh, clear. Yes, thank you. Yeah, thank you. So one important thing from this slide is the equivalent circuit because we are going to use it in almost all the, uh, you know, um, problems. Then we discussed uh, different, um, for example, this, equa this equation and the proof, we will see it today. The, this one is, is important. We saw it in one of the uh, uh, exams. They ask it for this proof with the phasor diagram. Okay, and changing the field, changing the, um, um, the, torque, the torque speed characteristic, for example, here, uh, we said the, say, uh, the speed regulation is zero. This is based on that we have a, sa a same uh, a speed even with the loading. And uh, today we are going to discuss something different. And this is the reason we split the, the synchronous machines into two, two parts. The first one is assuming that we have a constant frequency. And second is that like we have slightly different in the frequency. And we will see what, what, what is the reason for that. Having like a speed regulation equals to zero, this is true if you are connected to a very strong and the big grid. Okay. This is what uh, we discussed, the open circuit. Sorry, can I ask okay, another with the question? Yes, please, yeah. Uh, sorry, in the slide nine, we said that uh, the generator is lagging and the motor is leading. Uh, but when we go to the slide 10, it, it looks like when we, for example, we are in the like, uh, uh, like motor, when we increase the load, uh, the, we, we are changing the, uh, like going from the, uh, like uh, lagging, uh, sorry, leading to the lagging. It looks like the motor is, for example, in IA4 is behaving like generator. Is is it a correct understanding? 
it's um, you know like here we used like different currents with different uh, power factor but let's say that we can definitely you can have something like uh, let's say i i uh, a1 you can have it like this if you increase the load it will be similar component similar power let's say as the ia4 so for this one it's um, we randomly choose the currents with the power factor but can we increase the the load at this power factor definitely and you can even increase it more so it was just um, showing uh, maybe like different powers like p1 is of course is less like let's say it's something like this p4 is more than p3 and so on and similar for the currents but lagging and leading doesn't matter you can have for example ia1 can be something like this now it's it's a, a lagging because it's it comes after the voltage we compare it to the voltage any current in this it's uh, uh, leading positive uh, angle in this it's lagging so, and the so value my, of the yeah so so my question is why uh, in the S slide on the page 19 we said that generators are lagging and motors are leading in the it's, uh, this, previous yeah page. this one is completely uh, uh you're talking about the this one this one is i picked like uh, two different uh, you know um randomly also two different cases oh, I but see. Uh, for the generator for the generator it can be leading too like this is normal oh okay if i like had the space if i had the space i can i can use like uh, this is v okay and the voltage leading and you will have exactly the same something like this this would be e and this is j x s i a and this is generator le leading. Can I have a, a motor a lagging? Definitely. It will be, this is the voltage and the current will be uh, lagging. Okay. And you will have uh, something because, because the angle of the E is uh, in this, but it, it will be uh, perpendicular. So you will have something like this, let's say, and this is the E. I'm sorry, like this one should be in this direction. But it's a generator. It's a motor, sorry. And J, X, S, I. So you can have a motor, but for this one, I said, okay, let's pick one. Like for the generator, let's say like um, lagging and for the gen uh, motor is le leading. But it doesn't matter like uh, in the, and we will solve uh, actually assignment number two, uh, problem three. We have a motor and I guess we are moving from leading to lagging or something like this, or we will put like a, a different loads, I guess. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. This is very good. And yes, like this is the main thing that we, I wanted to, uh, we went of course uh, through this proof uh, what what is XS and it, why it's not like XA for the armature? We said it's the armature plus the self reactance, right? It's both. And and this is one example for um, uh, the question. We have like uh, this is a generator, of course. How did I know it's a generator? Because E has a positive angle delta. This is the angle delta. The E is you know like has like uh, it's uh, let's say like the uh, e is leading the v so it's a, a generator if e is is in the in this side in the negative side it will be a motor this is a unity power factor you can have a lagging power factor you can have a leading power factor and this is something um interesting and and actually like good for the synchronous for the synchronous machine you can move from leading lagging unity power factor at any time at any time the induction machines we will see now always lagging induction machines always lagging synchronous machines it can move between leading and lagging and you have the control how can we control this 
we control this by the controlling the field or the excitation. So you play with the excitation, you can change from leading to lagging. Uh, yes, I believe, uh, Lucas, you have a question? Yes. Please uh, go ahead. Th this is about the, probably covered the, the question three uh, in the, in this case, uh, the question said, uh, well, I, if I'm not misunderstood, the, the field was keep the same. So I, I should assume the, the induced, uh, voltage was yes. uh, was the same right the the only yes. thing that changed was so there is a, a translation uh, the transposition of the the angles should keep the same uh, difference between the terminal voltage and the uh, induced voltage mm -hmm. with the yes. different power factor isn't it yes yeah i guess you are uh, and they can put something here try to make sure that you I understand you um, correctly. With the field, because you have the field, this is the field. You, uh, let's say, let's call it field, not like the F. You, you are doing the flux. Because you are controlling this flux through a DC in the synchronous machines, and the E equals two, K, which is constant, the flux, which is you can you can control times the omega. We said omega is constant, it's the synchronous speed. So this one is constant, this one is constant. So you are controlling your E by controlling your field. If you increase the field, what will happen? You will increase the E, magnitude of the E. Because you increase the magnitude of your of the, the E, what will happen? You have E here and V. You increase this magnitude. The voltage here is, let's say it's still constant. You increase this, the, the reactive power will go on to this way. When reactive power is going this way in the generator, it will be, you are, you, you are like uh, changing or like you are uh, supplying the active power in the generator. Supplying reactive power in the generator, it means it's lagging like this. So you can see the E is larger than the V. There's a magnitude, I'm talking here about magnitude. If you decrease your, your uh, flux, E will be smaller, E will be smaller. And now you turn from uh, giving, uh, supplying reactive power, to uh, absorbing reactive power, okay? And this is the case of the leading power factor. Okay, because now you are absorbing. The voltage of the terminal is as a magnitude. I'm talking about as a magnitude is larger than the E. Of course, if you can reach to the point that E and uh, like the V are uh, as a magnitude plus this one, of course, we, we add the the, um, the voltage drop here. If you reach it to this, now you will reach to the level of the unity power factor. Okay, so this is the one, this is the voltage, as you can see, this is the, the, uh, the part of the um, voltage drop here because we add the voltage drop here. So if this plus this equals to the E, then you are unity power factor. You are not giving, you are not, um, you know, or you are not giving to here, but actually like E is giving the, the, the inductance, your internal inductance reactive power. That's the reason E is slightly larger than the V to give, to give this reactive power of this one. At the terminal, the Q equals to zero. Okay, so how can we control the E is by controlling the flux, the field. And I'm talking about the magnitude. One thing about the power system, and this is this one is important, is that um, if you have two buses and you have something, let's say like a reactance and the resistance in between, the magnitude of the angle 
control the power. Let's say you have angle theta one, theta two. If theta one is larger than theta two, then the power flow from this to this as an active power P from the higher angle to the lower angle. For the reactive power, it depends on the magnitude, not the angle, on the magnitude. If the magnitude of the voltage, magnitude of the voltage here, let's say V1, and this one is V2 as a magnitude, if V1 is higher, then the reactive power will go from the higher to the lower. If V2 is higher, then it will go in the opposite way. So this is how, like the difference between um, the flow of the active power and the active power based on the bus or two buses, voltages, magnitude, and angle. Magnitude and angle. One last point, like uh, note here, is if you have a load, this, this load, and it's absorbing active power, of course, it's a load. If it's absorbing Q, we call this one as lagging. If your load is, of course, always taking active power, but if it's giving reactive power, we will say this one is leading, it's giving reactive power. Look at the generator because the generator is interesting. I, I, I said it here, but I want to explain it more. That, of course, this is a generator, so it's a given uh, P always as a generator. If it's giving reactive power, this one we call it lagging. If it's absorbing reactive power, okay, and this one is P. We call this one is leading. This is opposite than the generator, right? Sorry, than the loot, the generator and the loot. Something I can give you like something just to make, to remove any uh, confusion. When the P and Q are same direction, we call it lagging. This is for the loot. Look at the generator. If the reactive power and the active power at the same direction, we call it lagging. If they have a difference between them, then it's lead, uh, leading. Just to make sure that no confusion here. Yes, because the generator is, uh, sorry? Yeah, that's important. Sometimes I made a mistake in refer to yeah. this. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So it's uh, because this one is, is making a lot of confusion when you say absorbing and supplying, and then you try to connect them to leading and lagging. So it's not correct. It's not like you have to split between the leading, lagging, absorbing, and supplying. If you are talking about the load, then we will we will understand. If you are talking about the generator, we will understand, but don't say only absorbing and supplying without connected to the leading and lagging. Okay. Hopefully this one is, uh, is clear, but if you have any question, I'm happy to answer any questions. The phasor diagrams here are important. Sometimes in the exam, they ask you to draw something, try to make like a sketch for uh, the phasor diagrams if it's required. Let's complete this one. The open circuit test and the short circuit test, we are going to solve a problem today about them. We use them actually to make the, to get the equivalent circuit. We said it's um, RA uh, plus JXS. Uh, then we said that it's just the XS because the, RA is very, very small to compare to the compared to the XS. Okay. And we will solve one problem and we will see like the differences. If no question, I can start the, um, right away the um, this uh, module, module number eight. Again, as I said, this is 
uh, we still have one more induction machines next time and that's it like we will complete the full um, PO exam related modules okay so for this one for this module we are going to cover mainly two important points it's the power flow of the synchronous machine and second point is regarding the droop okay or the governor response or uh, we can call it like the frequency power relationship as we discussed we will not have a certain or a constant frequency anymore even with the synchronous machines if it's uh, connected to small system they can have different frequencies than the 60 hertz and it depends on the loads and uh, or demand and generation relationship last point is we are going to solve some of the problems uh, it's a solved problems but very important and we will see that some of the solved problems actually in the sync for, for the synchronous uh, machines already um, were in some of the previous exams so let's start the generator power flow for the generator power flow we um as you can see we here cover only the generator definitely if it's a motor it will be on the opposite way and similar to what we did for the transformer and then in the dc machines this is for the synchronous we have the input because this is a generator the input is mechanical torque times the omega this is the input power to sometimes we call it like the um, uh, the power in the shaft okay the prime mover so you will you will hear in the problems different expression for this input power so for example like the prime mover okay um, input of course power uh, maybe the power on the shaft okay then we have losses the power converted from mechanical to electrical sometimes they call it like the induced and then you have some losses electrical losses and then at the end is the output power efficiency eta equals to the output over the input p out over p in times if you want to get it in percentage times 100 percentage as we said in transformers it's almost like 90 87 percent like very high in rotating machines they are between 80 let's say to 90 95 percent okay definitely it's less than 100 losses let's let's talk about the losses we have the core losses it's uh, as we discussed before it's the ad current losses and um, hysteresis losses okay mechanical losses is regarding the friction between the bearings and the shaft and um, the windage due to the air okay because some some of the rotating machines are rotating in a very high speed so even the uh, the friction of the air is important taking some of the energy stray losses they found that after adding the electric losses to the core and mechanical losses it seems they are not balancing between the output and the input because as you know that the input power equals to the output plus losses right so it seems they couldn't in some cases they couldn't reach to the hundred percent or like uh, they didn't reach to this equation so they add some of the losses here and they call it stray losses okay here and this is important of course in in the problems if the losses are not given then we assume that they are zero if not given just 
assume uh, like you can uh, actually write this assumption assume that all okay, all the losses are zero you can calculate the losses here in the uh, i square r if r is given actually if r is not given then you don't have the uh, so sometimes you create like the copper losses the losses in the uh, copper of the your winding okay here not similar like to or like uh, opposite to the transformer the core losses we do not um, calculate or like we don't have equation if you remember in the transformer we, we said like v squared or like the v no load squared over the r of the uh, core but we here nothing like we don't have any equation you cannot the only one you can calculate is this one if the r a is given mechanical losses you get it as a number if not then it's zero similar to the stray losses okay one important note is regarding the synchronous machines synchronous machines are always three phase three phase of course it's ac three phase if you remember we already discussed the machines the dc it's dc machines there is no ac right uh, we discussed the transformer. We said it's, of course, the transformer is always AC, but what we have here in this uh, course that uh, we have a single phase and the PO exam, it's always a single phase, not three phase. For the synchronous machines and the induction later, it's AC and the three phase. For the three phase, take care of you know, three or square root three or something and line to line voltage and current and phase. So there is um, like um, some, sometimes you will use the three and square root three, of course. For example, here for the losses, the, we said I square R losses. In the reality, we will add three, right? It's a three I square R. And you can see we use the phases here with the three square root three if you are using the line values, similar with the power two, active and active power. Okay. Okay, very good. Now we cover the power flow of the generator. This is what we discussed regarding, regarding the equation and this proof we said this proof is uh, important in the theory we have uh, this equation so first we assume that ra the armature resistance is zero this is uh, this is based on this equation um, from this phaser randomly we said this is lagging can we do it for leading definitely this one, this proof is for both. Like it's not just for lagging. So we assume that, uh, and you can write the assumptions in the proof that you have the RA is zero and the system is lagging or your generator is lagging. Okay. IA is the current. This is the angle. And this is the voltage. Because you, you assume that RA is zero. So between E and V, it's only J, X, S, I, A. If you remember from the equivalent circuit, this is the V phase, this is the E, and this is J, X, S. And you have a current, right, I. I or I, A, armature. E or E, A, sometimes. And sometimes we, we write it like in a small or a capital, it doesn't matter. It just you can call it as uh, armature or just the current that's it that's it's not uh, all like the voltage here uh, we said ac and phasor they are all phasors magnitude and angle so you add this you will have the e look at this angle because they are opposite so this equals to this 
you have two um, triangle, right angle triangles. This uh, the two angles here are equal. This is ninety, so theta equals to theta here. Okay, using the trigonometric functions for j x s i a, you will find that this part is x uh, x s i a cosine theta, and this part is the sine. This is E with the angle delta. So this one is E cosine delta, and this one is E sine delta. And from this, you can get the current times the cosine equals to the E sine delta over xs. You put it in the power equal to, you know, 3V phase I cosine theta, so you change this to E A sine delta and you will get this equation. If the torque is required, only you will put the omega because as you know, the torque equals the power over omega. Okay. I think we covered this uh, last time, but this is a very important proof in the exams and uh, included in our slides. If no questions, we can go to solve some of the examples. Any question so far? Okay, if there is no question, we can um, start it with the examples and then we will go with the parallel operation of the synchronous machines. So for the examples, we I picked some of like the important actually like solved examples in the textbook. This is the first one is um, you have, of course, the synchronous generators. Most of the problems are synchronous generators. Few problems are regarding the motors. And uh, even in the assignments, I, I picked one of the previous exams for the synchronous motors because it's not very common. So I said, okay, let's let's get one of the synchronous motors to make sure that you you understand both. But to, to be honest, like the majority is synchronous generators. You have, this is 200 kilovolt amps, 480 volt, 50 hertz, okay, 50, not 60, star connected because it's a three phase. So if it's a star connected, I know the given one is the line. So if I'm, I'm going to use this voltage, don't forget to divide it or divide it by square root three. The field, okay, rated field uh, current is five amps. Okay. And uh, they did three tests. The first one is the open circuit, short circuit, and then DC test, DC voltage test. That's because we, we covered only like the, in the previous meeting, the first two, but we, we didn't discuss the DC uh, voltage test. So the first two is regarding the open circuit. If you remember, for the open circuit, we had, um, you can call it E or V open circuit with the field the current IF. And you have the open circuit characteristic. At a certain IF, the IF rated, you have this voltage. Okay. You have to, again, you have to divide this voltage by square root three because it's a star connected. And this is the terminal. Let's say if you have a generator, remember the generator. 
Okay. If it's across the terminals, now it's the line. So always divided by square root C. If it's delta, you have to divide the current, not the voltage. Okay. So for the short circuit test, the current is, let's say you have, this is the short circuit test. And uh, here is another axis for the current, IA. And uh, at the IF rated, you have an, a current. So you have a voltage and the current at the same field current. Okay, and this is the current. From this and this, I can actually use the test to get the impedance synchronous, which is the RA plus JXS. We said it's equal to the V uh, open circuit phase, of course, open circuit, but phase over the I short circuit, both, of course, at the, the same field the current, which is the case. So you can get this value. You have this divided by square root 3 divided by the 300. You can get it. What is this test? This test is actually the DC test. You put like a DC source or like a, a DC source here. And you measure and a meter, a DC a meter. And you get the value of this current. Because you put a DC, it's a DC, right? So any winding, for example, the JXS, will be short circuit. This one will be short circuit, right? So short circuit, short circuit here. The E, because you have some E here, the E will be zero because you don't apply any um, field. So what you will see here, you will see a DC source with RA and another RA and then connect it to the VDC. You have another RA, but it's a floating. It's not connected to anything. For this circuit, you, you have two RAs in series, actually. Why they are in series? Because you can ignore this resistance. So the current, the same current will flow in both of them. As long as they are, it's the same current flowing, then it means it, they are in series, even if you have something here, because no currents here, it's a floating, you can completely ignore. So you have the voltage DC and the current. If you divided the VDC over the current, you will get two of the RA. So RA equals to VDC, which is the 10 over two times the I, DC, let's say IDC. So you can calculate the RA and you have the ZS as a magnitude. You can have because ZS squared equals to, sorry, RA squared plus XS squared. If you already calculated the ZS as a magnitude and you get the RA, you can calculate the XS magnitude. And this is actually what they are asking for. They're asking find the values of the armature resistance, RA. RA, you can get it from the DC, the DC um, test. The synchronous reactance, the XS, they said something like about a, approximate. Okay. Just to show you, like, okay, if you got the XS from here, if you ignore the RA, what is the value of XS? Ignoring RA and without ignoring RA, what is the difference? Okay. Before we see the solution, I just want to make um, something regarding the DC source, and we are going to cover it again in the induction. 
but it's um, important. This one was star, del star connected, and we saw the. This is how we did the DC. What if it was delta? Okay, and you put a DC source here. This one is floating. So you will have two RAs. Ignore this one. Two RAs in series with one RA in parallel, right? It means you will have two RA in parallel with one RA. So actually you will have two summation over uh, or multiplication over summation, it will be two over three of RA. So instead of two RA that I put it, you will put two over three of the RA if the connection is delta. Okay, we are going to cover this in uh, the induction machines because we have you will see the equivalent circuit is more interesting with the induction. Like it's more, not complicated, but it's like more uh, tests. We will do three tests. One of the tests are the DC uh, test. Okay. Any question before we see the answer for this? Okay, so for this one, the answer is like two RA. We started with the DC. Then we calculated the RA, 0.2 ohm, it's very small. Then we divided the uh, voltage by square root three. We divided by the current to get the XS, 1.04. Okay, what if you ignored the um, X, uh, sorry, RA, if you ignored RA and you take uh, XS as E over IA immediately, like without the RA, so it will be 1.04. Can you see the difference between the XS with, and this is with the RA and this one without the RA? It's a very, very uh, small value, like 0.02. The difference, so it's uh, almost nothing. Okay. Any question before we go to the next example? So you can see actually the values here. Okay. And this is EA, so you can see EA. Per phase, it's almost the 312. Angle delta, we don't know the angle, right? Okay, before we can have a, like a quick break, uh, 10 minutes break, before we uh, continue the examples, okay? Okay, for this problem, it's um, Delta connected uh, synchronous generator. And let me get the pen. So it's a 480 volt, it's a Delta. So we are going to use this volt, this voltage, 60 Hertz this time, Delta connected. Uh, number of the poles are four, okay. P equal four. So this is P is number of poles, not the active power. Okay. And they have the open circuit characteristic. Open circuit characteristic, as we said, it's usually, even with um, DC machines or synchronous, it's the field, the current, and the E. Okay. We will see it in the next slide. This generator has a synchronous reactance. This is XS. And armature resistance with this, so armature resistance is given, it's not zero, it's not ignored. So we have RA. 
Okay, this one is delta. And this is the voltage. At full load, the machine supplies this current with this power factor lagging. So giving the entire uh, power as a current. Don't forget to divide this current by square root three because it's a delta. Again, under full load conditions, the friction and windage losses are this. Core losses are this values. So it's giving the sum of the losses. Okay. And they, they said ignore the field uh, uh, circuit losses. And this is what we usually do like, because the field, as we said, they, they have a separate supplies and we ignore this, this uh, DC supply. Okay. Okay. So for this problem, now we have everything. Um, the next slides, we will see the requirements and the uh, open circuit characteristic. So this is the open circuit characteristic, the, ter the voltage, and this is the field, okay? This is the list of the things that required from this problem. So first point is asking for what is the speed of rotation of this generator? We already discussed at the beginning of this um, session frequency equal p number of pools n in rpm over 120 this one is very important so frequency which is usually 60 or 50 number of the pools it depends some some of the machines and we will discuss this in the knowledge problems some of the pools um, some of the machines they have uh, two Four, like our case, maybe six, like it's always even um, number, okay? Always even. If you have north, then you have south, that's it. If you have two north, so you have two souths and, and so on. And uh, in the machine, the north and south is, uh, they, they must like change. If it's north, then south, then north, then south. For example, four pools. You cannot put like north, north, south, south, because then it will be equivalent to one north and one south, right? So it will be two pools, not four pools. So they, they must change when you rotate the generator should uh, or the windings, conductors should see difference, positive, negative, positive, negative, and so on. We are using this equation as it is, but in different textbook, and this is the one we have it in the textbook. In some other textbooks, you will find its frequency equal P n over 60, not 120. And the reason for that is this, this one is the number of pool pair, pool pair. For example, if you have four number of pools, the pairs are two. That's the reason if you multiply this by two, it will give you the four and you multiply this by two, it will give you the 120. Just in case you saw this equation in somewhere. But we are going to use this because this is the one we have it in the textbook. Because you have the number of the pools, you have the frequency and you have the 120, it's a constant. So you can get the N, the speed of rotation of the generator in RPM. RPM. I always recommend that when they ask it for the speed to go to radian per second. Give both answers in N RPM and Omega. And the only thing you, you need to do to move from RPM to a radian per second is multiply by two pi over 60. That's it. If you have radian per second and you want to move it to this, multiply by 60 over two pi. Okay, that's it. You will find this this uh, you know question in many of the synchronous machines. Okay, 
Next, how much field current IF must be supplied to the generator to make the terminal voltage with this value at no load? So for the no load, we can assume that, okay, you have the or generator, you have RA. You can assume that at no load, this is a um, generator. At no load, it means this one is open circuit, right? So at no load, there is no current here. The E equals to the V. So the terminal voltage equals to this at no load. It means it's the E. It's not just the V at the no load. It's the E because no current is here. So E is given by the 480. What is the field current? For this, we should use the open circuit characteristic in the previous slide. So you have, this is the IF. And this is the E, and you have this one. You have the E, you get the IF. Similar to what you did in the midterm, or midterm, the number here shouldn't be exactly equal to what we have in the answers. Sometimes because, you know, like it's a, it's a very difficult to get like the exact number. So try to get like approximate number. And we discussed this in the midterm. If you remember the BH curve, if you go from the B to get the H, so you can find some difference. And that's okay. In the answers, in the model answer, we don't expect you to get the exact the same numbers that we have. C. Any answer, any like question before we? Uh, Go to the C or answer C. Okay, C, if the generator is now connected to a load, now you connected your generator to a load, it's not, you know, open circuit anymore. What is the amount of the load? So it's connected to the load that draws 1,200 amps and 0.8 power factor lagging. So you know the current. Don't don't forget to divide it by square root three because this is a line, and um, as we said, this is a data connected. So divide it by eight uh, square root three, uh, and point eight power factor lagging. Okay, lagging. How much field current will be required to keep the terminal voltage equal to this? So you need the terminal voltage as a 480 volt. And you have the current. You will try to calculate E and do exact magnitude, of course, and uh, use the open circuit characteristic. How can we do this? By writing the equation, it's E from this. E equals to this voltage drop times the current. So you can say I times RA plus JXS plus K okay, the voltage, this voltage, the V. All in phasors, okay? The voltage is, they said you need to keep it as 480 deg uh, and zero degrees as a reference. I, I'm not going to use X, uh, square root three because this is a voltage and it's a delta connected machine. XS given, RA is given. What is the current? The current is the magnitude uh, 1200 over square root three and the angle is lagging, so negative cosine inverse uh, 0.8. Can I calculate the E? Yes, I can calculate the E as a magnitude and the angle. Use this magnitude with, as we said, this one. So this one. Get the, the field current. This is how, like, this is what they are asking for. 
how much field current will be required to keep the terminal voltage at this value, even with the load, right? Okay. Next, if no question. So next for D, how much power is, genera is the generator now supplying? Generator supplying, okay? And how much is supplied to the generator by the prime mover? Generator is now supplying, it means it's the output power. How much is supplied to the generator by the prime mover? This is the input power. Then what is the machine overall efficiency? It's the output over the input times the 100% percentage, the eta, the efficiency. So what is the output power? I already, like you already have the current. The current it's in the, here. You have the power factor and you have the voltage. Make sure to use, for example, if you want to multiply this times this times this and the current in the uh, line, uh, multiply by square root three. And this is the power. Voltage, current and power factor. P equal square root three, I, because it's a line, V cosine theta or V or, or uh, phi. So you have the P and this is the output power. This is the, the power of the load. This is what the generator is supplying. What is the input here? To get the input power, what is the difference between the input and the output? It's the output plus losses. What kind of losses? First, they already given uh, the core losses as a number, right? They already given the mechanical losses as a number in what? What other losses? It's the I square R, the copper losses. I know the current flowing, sorry, the current here, flowing. It's this over square root three. And I know the resistance, the RE. So three, don't forget the three, I square RE. And this current in phase, don't forget to divide this by square root three. Because why I always like say, divide this by square root three? Because if you look at the connection of the delta, this current is here. And we are talking about the phase because this drawing, this uh, circuit is per phase, is one of this. So uh, this current, you have to divide it by square root three. At the end, the efficiency, it's the output. We already ca calculated the output over the input divided uh, times 100. And in percentage, this is the if, uh, overall efficiency or eta. It should be less than 100%. It should be something between 80 to 90, 95% for um, the generator or like the rotating machines in general. If no question, I can go to E. E is just, they, they want just your, your um, explanation if the generator load is suddenly disconnected from the uh, line, what would happen to the in, in uh, external voltage? So you have your generator, it was connected to a load. You have the E and this is your load. Let's say you have a breaker here and you open your breaker. Now there's no load, it's open circuit again. What is the terminal voltage? Definitely it will be E. Does the E is, uh, or like the E is going to change? No, because E, it depends on the K, the constant. So it's a constant. The field, we didn't change the field. And the speed, we didn't change the speed. So E is constant. So the terminal voltage will be the E. That's it. 
at the end, and he said, suppose the generator is connected to another load. It's similar load actually, but it's uh, now it's uh, leading instead of lagging. And they asked about the field current. So it's exactly similar to the C. And now it's leading. So when you do the current, like get the, the getting the current, you will put with the angle positive. That's it. They actually doing this to compare between the when you have leading load and lagging load, what is the difference for the field current? If you have generator, okay, connected to a load. If this load is lagging or leading, what is the difference for the field current here? If you remember from the first uh, few minutes in our in this session, I already discussed something about we use this field to produce reactive power. So if you have leading power factor, leading it means it's giving reactive power. So you will not need the active power from the generator. Actually, your generator will get reactive power. So your field current is very small. However, if it's a lagging power factor for the load, it means it's absorbing. So you need to increase your field to give the uh, your load. So without solving even this problem, I know that the IF for the lagging load will be higher because you need to support it. Let's, let's see the answers and discuss it. So the first one is this, this is the equation that we have. You get the speed in RPM. I always recommend to go and use or, or convert it to radian per second too. The voltage, they said 480, they went to the open circuit. As you can see, 480. They said it's almost 4.5 feet the current. Okay. If you said 4.6, 4.4, that's okay as long as it's close. The second part is to calculate the field current. The you first, uh, don't forget to divide it by square root C to get the current. Calculate the E, and now you have the E and the delta. Use this E, 503, uh, 532, 532, use it here and get the current. Sorry. 5.7. Okay. It did the output, input. So output is all you already have everything. This one is 0.8. I don't know why they put it like as an angle, but you know it, it's 0.8. You have the input, it's the output plus the losses. One, two. And three, one important thing for the electric losses or the copper losses, it's a three I square R, three I square R. Then the efficiency, it's output over input times 100% percentage. 89, that's perfect number. For the generator, that's a perfect, or for rotating machines, that's a very good one. Okay. What will happen if the generator disconnect? Current will be zero and the E will be the V. And the, the feed the current not to change, so E will not change. Okay, we already calculated this value. So it's the same value. This said, calculate the field current if you change the shunt, uh, sorry, if you change the, the um, uh, load to leading, 
then you calculate, you will find, because it's a leading, you will find the less current in the field, less current. So which type, okay, of the load leading or lagging needed a larger field current, okay, to maintain the rated voltage? Which type of loads placed more thermal stress? Because if the current is higher, it means you have I square R higher, so it's like thermal stress. Of course, this is the lagging power factor. And you know the reason. Because for the lagging power factor, you need reactive power. You need to increase your, your flux, your field to support it. Okay. Any question so far? Oh, it seems I have. Sorry, maybe I have some problem here. Okay, yeah. now it's working. Any question before we go to the next? Uh... Next problem? Oh, it seems I have a problem with... Uh... I'm not sure. Let's, let's keep it like this. If, uh... Any problem so far or? Okay. okay, let's solve um, another one. So we are trying to cover all the ideas for the synchronous machines through some of the problems. This one is like six pole. You have the voltage, frequency, and it's star connected. So don't forget to divide this by square root three. The voltage, I'm talking about the voltage. Uh, number of the poles are six poles, so the P equals to six. And the generator has a per phase synchronous reactance, so this is the XS. Full load current, this is the current and the power factor given. The generator has a friction and windage, so this is the mechanical losses you have. Core losses, okay, you have. Since the armchair resistance is being ignored, RA is zero. Okay, and you neglect I square R. Field the current has been adjusted so that the terminal voltage is this as no load. So terminal voltage is this at no load. It means this is the E. But before doing it, don't forget to divide it by square root C and this is the E. So let's see, let's see what we have. We have, um, it's a generator, right? We have the, the E magnitude, only the magnitude of the E. It's like 480 divided by square root three. We don't know the delta angle. We, we have a voltage here, angle zero, but we don't know the magnitude of the voltage. We know the, the load, there is a load here. We have the current as a magnitude and angle. Magnitude is 60, angle is lagging, so minus cosine inverse 0.8. And this one is 60. So it's like the current equal I equal to 60. Here is this one. It's 60 divided by, or angle, minus cosine inverse of 0.8. For the E, I already have the magnitude, right? But I don't have the angle. Okay. So first one is regarding, it's the same one, like the same as the previous uh, problem, the speed of rotation. Again, with the uh, synchronous machines, usually this is like the first question. Even if you check the previous exams, this is like almost the first question in almost all of the synchronous machines. 
problems. So frequency equal the number of the pulse times the n over 120, because here we are using the number of pulls, not the pull pairs. Speed, this is what we need. Frequency, let's say it's 50, 60, so it's given here. What is the terminal voltage for the machine? Okay, if the load is similar to what we have. Okay, so they are asking about terminal voltage. Terminal voltage, it's the V. How can we calculate the V? To calculate the V, we can use the simple E equal, the simple equation V plus JXSI. We have the I. You can cal you can say I I A and E A. We already have the E the I A. Right? This is the I. So the I is given. XS is given. It's here. However, with the voltage, we have the we don't have the voltage. We have only it's the V and the angle zero. That's it. For the E, we don't have the angle. It's 480 square root three and the angle zero. Sorry, angle delta. We don't have the angle. So we don't have the angle and we don't have the voltage magnitude. How can we calculate this from this equation? This is actually, it's not one equation. It's two equations because this one is complex. In the complex numbers, you have two equations, actually. For example, if you have, like, let's say, um, A plus JB equals to 3 minus J4, you say that you can say the real equals to the real, so A equals to 3 and B equals to minus 4. So you say real equals to the real and imaginary equals to the imaginary. So with this one, actually it's two equations and you do it like this. So how can we do it with this? So you can say uh, 480 square root three and this is delta. So you, you say cosine delta, this is the, the real, right? And here it's a V, so it's equal V magnitude, cosine zero, it's zero, uh, sorry, is, is one. And for this one, you have to use the equation. So you have the XS one, it's one ohm already. I, it's like 60. And the angle will be 90 degrees because of the J minus cosine inverse of 0.8. So you can say this one is plus x is 1, so multiply by 60, so 60 cosine 90 minus cosine inverse 0.8. You can solve, like this is one equation with the two unknowns, delta and v. The second one, you will do the imaginary sine delta. It will be here like this, this magnitude sine delta. The V is zero because sine zero is zero. And plus this is exactly the same, but sine instead of cosine. Okay. You can first start with this one to solve, get the delta, then substitute here to get the V. And that's it. This is one example to solve that complex equation. Real equals E, real, and imagine equals imagine. Another thing, and this is actually what they used here in, uh, in the textbook to solve, is to use the phasor diagram. So from the phasor, you have V, and uh, this is lagging, 
and then you add with the 90 degrees this and this is e okay this is j x s uh, i a okay so you can use this right angle which is e squared e as a magnitude equals to the v as a magnitude plus remember this one it will be x s i a this is theta and this is theta sine theta and this one all squared plus this one squared which is x s i a cosine theta squared using the this right angle triangle as a magnitude this is e and the e squared equals to this squared plus this squared and this now you get rid of the delta you don't need the delta so you have already you have the uh, sorry you you need the voltage right so you already have the e you already have the xs you already have the i you can of course you have the uh, sine and cosine because you already have the cosine theta equals to 0.8 you already have this 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 and that's it you can calculate the voltage so this is another um, technique to solve the complex number is using the phasor and the right angle uh, rules. Be care because in the lagging, you put negative sign. Sorry, in the leading, in the lagging positive, as you can see. In the leading, you put negative. For the unity power factor, this one will be one and this one will be zero, right? Okay. Any question so far? I can show you the answer for this. I'm not sure if we have uh, other points. Oh, yes, we have, of course, yeah, because it would be a very small problem. So after we solve it, this. Oh, okay. After we solve it, this uh, part, we they asked about the efficiency of the generator. We already have the losses. We already have the, the P out, right? Because we have the current, we have the um, power factor, we have the voltage, we already calculated the voltage. So power is square root three V I cosine theta. So you already, have the output power. How can we get the efficiency? You need to get the input power. Input power equals to the output plus the losses. Losses already given in the problem. We don't have I square R or I mean like three I square R because R is already ignored, is already zero. So you can get the P input. Efficiency is output over the input times 100%. This is in percentage. And you can check the answer. It should be something between 80 to 90 something. D, they asked about the torque. The torque in the shaft, when the, they say the shaft for the generator, it means the output, uh, sorry, the input. So this is the input. It means the input power over the omega, over the speed. Omega and radian per second. We already calculated the, the N, if you remember. N in RPM. Now you multiply by 2 pi over 60 to use this as the radian per second. Input power, we already calculated the input power in the efficiency. 
And this, they said how much shaft torque must be applied by the prime mover at the full load. And then they, they said how large is the induced counter torque. So if you wanted the induced, not the input, this is this was the input or the shaft, we can call it shaft. The induced, it's equal to the P induced or P converted over the omega. What is the P uh, induced? So it's the power, if you remember, it's the output power actually, because the induced is the power here. Right, and because you don't have any losses here for the RE, then the output power is equal to the induced. Last point here, they said, what is the voltage regulation of this generator at a certain power factor or power factors? So voltage regulation is the V no load minus V full load over V full load. Okay. V no load, it's the E, it's the voltage here. Full load is the one that we calculated in the previous, like point, uh, I believe, uh, B. So you put E, it's the voltage when there is no load. This is the no load. And then you put the voltage and multiply by 100 percentage. Okay. And you can do it or calculate it at different power factor. With different power factor, you can calculate the different E's. Okay. Or different V's, sorry. Because E is constant. As long as you have constant power factor, uh, constant, sorry, a constant uh, flux. Uh, constant speed, then E is constant. So E is constant, and you have to multiply to, to calculate the V, the magnitude of the voltage. Let's let me show you the answers for this. So the first one is to calculate the speed in RPM. Get the speed again in radian per second. Always do like this in the exam. RPM and radian per second. Then the, the, um, uh, this one is regarding uh, calculating the uh, voltage. Okay. So they said like the E will not change with, um, you know, like the E is the same E uh, after loading, of course. And then you can calculate this from the, this equation. This is the one that we used um, here. You can use the one uh, for the complex uh, number equation as the real equals to the real, imaginary equals to the imaginary, or you can use this. This should give you the same, uh, you know, like uh, answer. Okay, this one is positive with the lagging, negative with the leading. Okay. And this term is zero when you have unity power factor, this one, because sine zero is zero. So you have different, you know, like, uh, uh, options, unity power factor, leading power factor, and so on. Okay, they ask about the efficiency. So first to get the output power, then these, they use the three years, so the voltage in phase, mechanical power or like the uh, mechanical input power. Okay, this is the powers we have. Electrical is zero because RA is zero. Efficiency output over input times 100%, 93%. That's a very good one. Torque is the input, because this is the torque in the shaft, is the input power over the omega in radian per second. Induced, it's the same, same omega, but the, the power, the converted, which is the exactly equal to the output because we don't have any armature losses. There was a typo in the... Um, 
in here because they used like different omega than what we used or what we calculated actually here, but it doesn't matter. Like it's not a big deal. It's just a typo. It's not um, something in the concept. Okay. Any questions so far? Voltage regression E minus the voltage for load. And you get the voltage for load at each time, right? By the way, for the voltage regulation here, you can, as they did here, you can use the line to line voltage because it's a ratio, right? If you use all line, that's okay, or all phases, okay. Here they use the 480, the line, but they use the line with the voltage for load. So that's okay. I don't like it. Some some of the let me open. Okay. By this, we reach it to the parallel operation of the generator. Okay. So to discuss this, I'm going to open the I believe one of the PDFs. Yes, this one. Uh, I already uploaded this. You can find it in the, our uh, website. I already uploaded it like uh, a long time ago. So this is solution one of the like number four for the past exam solutions. So for this one, we are like, I put some notes about if you have generators, synchronous generators, of course, in parallel, there are some different cases, okay? Before we start, let's discuss something related to like the values for the frequency and power. We said like usually the frequency is constant. This is what we used to, to, uh, to, um, to assume in the last previous examples. But now we are going to have a curve between the power and the frequency. Okay, so, and sometimes we call it like the, instead of the frequency, the speed. Because as we said, the frequency is proportional with the speed. Frequency equals to the, the number of the poles times the N over 120. Number of the poles are equal and constant for the same machine, right? It's not going to change. So usually the frequency is representing the speed. So frequency or speed, it doesn't matter with the power, and there is a slope. What is the meaning of this slope? First, at zero power, there is something here called like speed at no load or, or frequency at no load. This is your machine is rotating. Let's say your generator is rotating. Uh, you're giving the mechanical power through the prime mover, maybe like a hydro, water, or steam, and it's rotating. Once you load, add more load to the machine. What do you expect if you have only one generator? It's not connected to the grid, but it's connected to a load. Once you added the load, let's say you added this load, you will find that the frequency and speed decreases. You add more load, the frequency decreases and so on. So this slope is, it, it makes sense, right? It's, it's, um, you add more load, your frequency or speed is reducing. You don't, you are not connected to the grid. Okay. And this, this slope is important because, um, and first you can, you can first change the, this uh, curve up or down or move it up or down. You can move it up or down using something called the governor. So what is the governor doing? It's owing the valve for the steam, for example. Or if you have hydro generation, you open the gates for more water. Once, let's say, you open the valve for more waters, at no load, the speed will increase. 
and it's it will be parallel to what you have. If you close the valve or close the steam or close the water, the, your no load will be reduced and it will be something like this. So why we I need to do, do, do this in using like your governor? Because let's say you were working, your generator were working at one. One is your full load. It's the 60 Hertz. And you added more load. So let's say your load was this, and then you added more load. You, you increase your load by this, this area, this, this part. What happened to your frequency? It's reduced than 60 Hertz. But you need your generator to be at exactly 60 Hertz. So how can I do this? I'm going to increase or open the valve. Okay, as you can see here, until you reach to the 60 Hertz back again. And this is the, and similar, if you reduce your load to this, now your frequency is more. So you need to close your, um, you know, like your uh, valve until you reach to the 60 again. The slope is because this is the Y, so it's Hertz per watt, kilowatt sometimes. Sometimes you call it like RPM per kilowatt. This is slope or one over the slope, we call it one over SP. And this is something very important. So the one over the slope is the one over SP or one over the uh, SP is the slope, okay? So SP is the unit of the SP is kilowatt per RPM, for example, or kilowatt per Hertz. Because SP is important and we are going to use it in, in the problems. And this is the case that we discussed. If you have a generator, standalone, sometimes you call it standalone, it's just a single generator, and you are adding or removing some loads. This is exactly the case. And the, by the way, they are asking you in the exam sometimes to sketch this. Um, sometimes they call it govern, governor uh, characteristic. Sometimes they call it droop characteristic. So droop or governor characteristic. Okay. okay. Now let's um, take, this is all the things that we discussed. So to summarize all the main points, I'm going to have four cases, okay? First case is the generator with loads. This is what we discussed now. So generators with loads. This is the equation. The equations is the power, maybe in, in kilowatt, let's say. S, as we said, it's one over the slope, remember? So it's maybe like it's kilowatt per hertz or megawatt if it's. Uh, then multiply by the frequency no load minus the frequency of the system. And just to be more, this is the, your load, let's say, this is the P of your load. This is the frequency of the system here. We call it system or the operating frequency. And this one is the no load, frequency no load. And this one is the straight line. Okay. This is the case you have one generator with uh, loads. And this is the case that we will solve as a solve it problem in the textbook. The second case is we call it the infinite bus. So infinite bus, it means it's like a bus 
in the power system with a very high strong system. So you have a, a constant voltage and constant frequency. Whatever you add the load, you add the generator, you add anything, you have a constant frequency, let's say 60 Hertz, and you have a voltage, a certain voltage, and it's constant again. So if you look at the slope now, the slope is zero or the SP is infinity. If you add any load or you, you generate, always the frequency is constant at the 60 Hertz, for, for example. Okay. Similar to the voltage and Q, you can add a line. Whatever reactive power you are generating or absorbing or supplying, you will have the same voltage. This is the infinite bus. Case number three, if you have a generator connected to the infinite bus, okay? So if you have this case, we draw it like this. This is the infinite bus side. This is the generator. The generator is normally, you have the no load frequency here and you have the slope. Infinite bus is just a line. Let's say you put your generator at this. So you are generating by this. This is your load. Let's say you have a load here. So your generator will help in this and the infinite bus will help in the other. If you want to get more, what you will do, your generator is connected to the infinite bus. You want to get more you will open the valve for the water or like the gates for the water or the valve for the steams and you move it up. If you move it up, the frequency is always at 60. So you will get more of the power, more of your load. Let's say you close, instead of opening, instead of opening the valve, you close the valve. What will happen? It will, you will go here. At this point, you are not getting any power, right? At this point, you are not getting any power. Actually, you can close more and more. Your generator will be a motor taking this power. So by opening the valve, closing the valve of the steam, if you open the valve, you get more steam, more power from your prime mover. You, you will take more power from the infinite bus. If you close the valve, you will reach to the neutral point, and then you can even turn to be a motor consuming power, not a generator. And this is a characteristic of infinite bus with a generator. What if you have um, two generators? And this is one of the problems in the exams. They did ask you for to plot the frequency and the power, or the what they call it, uh, governor, governor or uh, droop characteristic. Okay, this one. So you have uh, two generators. They have different no load frequencies and different slopes. Okay, and then you uh, have a load, and this is the share of the load. This is the total load. This is your share from the generator one, and this is the generator two. If you reduce the load, for example, you will have this share. Okay. The last point is regarding the speed regulation, or sometimes you call it speed droop, no load minus full load over full load. Now it's not zero, as we said before. Now you your frequency is changing, so you may have different frequencies or different speed group. Okay. By the way, like if you if you said speed group, you can say F no load, F full load, and F full load. The reason for that is that, as we said, the frequency is proportional with the speed. It's the frequency equal P N over 120. P is always constant. So, Whatever the you have frequency, it's 
exactly similar to the, the speed. Okay, any question? Okay, if no questions, maybe we can have a very quick break, maybe like five minutes or so, and then we can um, continue this. Uh, yeah, let's solve this problem, and then we are going to solve the one from the previous uh, exams. So this one is one generator and multiple loads. Let's read the problem. So it's consider a generator that is already supplying a load. So you have a generator and supplying a load. Okay. Then a second load. So you will have a second load is connected. So this is load one, load two to be connected in parallel with this load. The generator has no load frequency. So this is the F no load is given as 61 Hertz. And a slope of SP, remember SP equals to one megawatt per Hertz. Look at the uh, units. So it's, it's correct, right? Watt per Hertz, this is the unit for the SP. Load one consumes a read power of 1,000 kilowatt. So this load is 1,000 kilowatt or one megawatt at 0.8 power factor. I think we are not going to use the power factor anyway. Why the load two is 800 uh, kilowatt at 0.7 or seven lagging power factor. Okay, so. This is the no load frequency. This is the SP, and this is the P1, and this is 800 is P2, okay? Before the switch is closed, what is the operating frequency that, remember the system frequency of this? So P1, when you have the, before the switch is closed, it was only load one. P1, which is the 1000, we know this one, 1000 kilowatt, okay, kilowatt. You can, uh, actually you can, you can move it to one megawatt because you have this slope in mega. It's equal to SP times F no load minus F system. This is the one that is needed. No load is given 61. SP is given one megawatt Hertz and P1 is one megawatt, 1000 kilowatt or one megawatt. So you can get the operating frequency or the, I can call it system frequency. After connecting load two, what will be the new, let's say operating frequency. So you have P1, P2, you have the same SP, you have you have the same no load frequency, but the system frequency or the operating frequency will be different now. You have another case. So this one is is not the same as this. It's the same no load frequency because it's the they didn't change it, right? They didn't change anything. You have the SP and you have one megawatt plus 0.8 megawatt. You can calculate the new system frequency. What do you expect about the system frequency? Will be higher or lower the expectation? So you have this load, and this is the frequency, this is your load, and then you increase the load. So I expect that the frequency is going to decrease. Look at C, after load two is connected, what action could an operator take to restore the system frequency again to, let's say 60 Hertz. To do this, you will find that the frequency of course lower than 60 Hertz. So to do this, you can increase the, or open the valve, make the governor open, the, the valve 
until you have a certain no load frequency. It will be higher, of course, than your normal no load frequency. Normal, I mean by normal is 61. So how can we do this? So we know that the load one plus load two equals to SP. We need a new no load frequency to reach to the 60 Hertz back again. So definitely you will find that this no load frequency is higher than the original, the 61. I can show you the answer and uh, they um, included very good, actually, you know, like diagram here for the power system with two loads. Of course, it's a three phase. All the synchronous machines are in three phase. First, you, we calculated the system frequency or operating frequency. It's 60 Hertz. Once you connected load two, calculate the new system frequency, it's lower. So after the load is connected, the system frequency falls, right? Reduces. To restore the system, the should increase the governor no load set point by 0.8 Hertz. So after you calculate, you remember the the one we we wrote with the 60 Hertz no at system at system frequency, you will find that the no load frequency is reached to 61.6 Hertz. It means your governor will open the valve and take more steam to increase its speed and reach to the 60 hertz back again. Okay. This was actually one of the uh, solved problems, very important. The This one is like just the summary of what we did that um, regarding the parallel load and supplying. So the active or real and reactive power supplied by the generators, it depends on the loads. You connect the load, then it's going to supply. Governor is to control the frequency. Make sure that you have good frequency, especially if the system is isolated. Okay. Isolated, but I mean by isolated, it's in remote areas. You only have very few generators connected to small loads or very few loads. Field current is used to control the voltage, of course. Push reactive power or absorb reactive power by controlling the field uh, current or the field regulator. Okay. I think that's it for this one, for this module. We finished, we completely finished module number eight. I'm going to solve some of the previous exams, it's just one, one problem uh, to complete this, and then we can look at uh, assignment number two. So for, let's go to the solution. So I don't know what happened with this. Yeah, there's something with, uh, okay. So this is problem in um, question number six in December exam, December 2009. And by the way, so I, I open here December uh, 2009. This is the problem, I believe question number six. So it's the last one, okay? And it was repeated in, as I told you before, sometimes they, they repeat the problems. In spring 2016, so they repeated the same question in 2016. So if you compare, I don't know, there's something, pro I have some problems with the PDF. But anyway, so you can see it's, um, yeah, exactly same problem, 2009 and 2016. Yeah, okay. So this one that we are going to solve, it's uh, the case number, I believe, two. We have two or um, I think, no, it's case number four. If you check this one, it's case number four. Yeah, this is the case. You have two generators and certain amount of loads. 
So let's let's read the the problem. So it's you have two um, synchronous generators at the end. So for the synchronous generators, both are six hundred uh, kilowatt generator A and B. Uh, they give you like the speed regulation for each one. So this is the speed regulation for A, and this one is the speed regulation for B, generator A and generator B. And they are supplying, um, they are in parallel supplying equal shares. Equal shares, it means PA equals to 500 kilowatt and PB equal to 500 kilowatt. A frequency at this hertz. So they are giving you the frequency of the system. So you have two generators connected in parallel, supplying one load of 1,000 uh, kilowatt, equal shares, and they are doing it at a certain frequency. Okay. Then they asked you to sketch the approximate governor characteristic for both machines on one set of uh, coordinate axes and indicate the operating frequency. So let's say one part, let's say the left will be B and this will be A. It will be something like this. How can we draw this? You need to get some points. First, one is the no load because you don't know which one is the higher, right? So the frequency at no load, to get it, we can use the speed regulation. Speed regulation equals to the speed, or you can use the frequency, frequency no load minus frequency full load over the frequency full load, for example, similar to A and B, right? You have the full load frequency, which is 57. Can I calculate the no load for the A and similar for the B? Okay, you can get this and you can get this. Of course, you can. You have to draw the sorry, write the full equation. So you will get the no load frequency. Okay. After having the no load, you will have. Um, you can get the slope actually, because the power of a equals to the sp of a times. Frequency of no load of A minus the frequency of the system. You have this, you have this, you have the power 500. This one is, cal we calculated, this one is 57. You can get the slope. Similar with the B, right? So you will know the slope or one over the slope, let's say, to be clear. So you will know exactly how to draw this. If the slope is high, it should be more vertical, but this is one over the slope. Let's say if the SP is high, it will be more horizontal. If it's low, then it will be more vertical. Okay. Anyway, it's just the sketch. At the end, you will have your load. Let's say this is your load, five, 500 here. 500 there, total is 1000. And this is your operating frequency. Can you calculate the operating frequency? They said, okay, indicate the operating frequency, it's this point, but can we calculate the operating frequency? Okay, it's the 57, it's already given here. So this one is 57. You know that the nullet frequency is, they are higher, of course. And you should label both curves. This is the A and B, and this is, for example, the power for B, and this is the power for A, and this is the frequency. On the same diagram, so we finished A, B, on the same diagram, the uh, approximate and new operating condition that assumes that the load on the bus decreases to the 400. So the, the load, this load decreases, it will go up. 
and the share will be different. It will not be equal shares anymore. So how can we get the new frequency and everything? For example, here they said new frequency, new load distribution and so on. So you have the, the power, the total power equals to PA and B, right? This now is 400. I know, I already know the slope for A. It's constant. I know the no load for A, but I don't know this, the system frequency. Plus that I know the slope for B. I know the no load for B, but I don't know the, the, free, the system frequency. Look at this equation. It's 400 plus this. Only the frequency, the new frequency is unknown. And I'm sure that this frequency must be higher than this, the 57, because it's less load. So you can calculate this one. After you calculate this one, you can calculate the separate A and separate B to know the, lo the load distribution between A and B. And the, the submission of both should be the 400 watt or kilowatt. Okay. Let me show you the answer for this. It's, um, it was new actually at this time, but it's repeated in 2016. So it was a very good problem. Two generators connected to a load. The load first was 1,000, then it's 400. I draw the two. This is the A and this is the B. This is the frequency. This is PA, PB, and the first load was 500, 500 was 1,000. Indicate the uh, operating frequency or system frequency, 57. Then you reduce the, the load to 400, you will have this. First, we have the speed regulation, which we can use for the frequency as well. Both are higher than 57 force. Total load is 400. This is the second. Uh, yes, I, I see one question. Yes, in this, this equation A and B, you are using as a full load, right? Uh, the frequency at full load. But they are not in the full load. The full load is 600 kilowatt, uh, it should be a problem or not? No, like it's a, so th this is a good question actually. So they said, okay, the governance speed regulation is two and five at this point. So it's, it doesn't matter because if they said the speed regulation at full load, then it's only the full load. We should use, for example, the 60 hertz. But if they said only like this, they provided the number respectively, and this is for, for this case. So we leave it for this one. Like we leave it with this, like uh, the 57. Okay. Yeah, I if can they assume said, the regulation is for this load, the, the, the variation of the frequency and the regulation, speed regulation is yes. at this load, okay? Exactly, exactly. But if they said this is the full load uh, speed regulation, then we have to use the full load. So I, by, mis like by mistake, I included like full load, but I meant it's this load, like it's the regulation for this load. However, if it's like full load, we should use the uh, 60 hertz if the speed regulation is at um, full load. We should use the 60 hertz. Okay. okay. And let's. So we put this. You can get the no load now. The no load will be these two. You get the total load, 400 kilowatt. A given. So it's a split. First, to get the slope for A and B in watt per hertz or kilowatt per hertz. 
for A and B. And for the new load, 400, it's the submission. Now get the system frequency for the system. Now it, uh, you should, by default, it must be higher because you reduce the load. The operating frequency was 57. You reduce the load, it will be higher, almost 58 hertz. And this is as, as expected from the diagram. The load distribution, how can we get it? Just sub, uh, put the, the frequency of the system at both of them. You will get two new powers. The submission must be the 400. This is your check. And by the way, the power for B is higher. If you look at your diagram, you put the 400, you find that the, the B is taking more because this slope is, you know, like more, um, or with the no load, of course, the frequency and the slope, by this, you will share more of the power compared to the B, uh, compared to the A. The A is very close to the no load, so it's almost sharing um, very little compared to B. Okay. Any question for this problem? Uh, by the way, uh, we had one knowledge problem or knowledge question regarding the infinite bus. Okay. But nothing for the problems itself, ju just the knowledge or the theory asking for the infinite bus for this case. I already uploaded the... Um, question, uh, some questions of the knowledge problem. You can find it in the past exams. So it's a very uh, interesting. This is the second one. This is what I, I was talking about, about the infinite bus. You can have a look and the next time we can discuss all of them. This is about the theory and about the questions uh, that uh, we... Uh, like the knowledge questions in the past exams. So I try to gather a good amount. It's not the total. I will upload more and more. So this is, uh, but this is a very good portion, actually. If you know this, then you have like um, many of the knowledge problems in the, actually, actually the majority of the knowledge problems in the, in this course. Any question before we go to uh, a quick, uh, you know, discussion about assignment number two, similar to what I did with assignment number one. As I said, for the assignments, uh, the target is not to, um, you know, like question you, but is to make sure that you train yourself solving the problems make sure that you you have like a timing also so this is the main thing and also as i said the assignments the midterm and the final exam all are from the previous exam so i'm not going to waste your time but it's all from the previous exams from the po okay so first one is transformer the transformer, let me open the, yeah, this. So transformer, open circuit test, short circuit test. First thing is asking what side the transformer where each of the uh, tests were taking, like uh, the open circuit and short circuit. Open circuit, we look at the voltage open circuit. It should be the rated. Short circuit, we look at the current. It should be the rated. You can see from your transformer that this one is at high voltage, okay? And if you calculate the rated current, you will find that this one also at the high voltage because S, the five uh, or the 15,000 over the voltage will get you the almost 
uh, or close to 6.25 amps. Okay, this is the rated current. So both at the high voltage and you have to do the calculations or like the explanation actually. D is to determine and sketch the approximate equivalent circuit for this transformer with all the voltages referred to the high voltage side. It's already referred to the high voltage side, right? So you have to do your calculations for the open circuit, short circuit test. Open circuit, you get the RC and XM or JXM. Short circuit, you get R equivalent and JX equivalent. Okay. Then they asked you about for the full load voltage uh, regulation, the efficiency. Okay. For the point 0.8 leading power factor. Full load, it means you can get the current, of course. We already got the, the uh, got the current as a magnitude and as an ang angle. So it's it will be plus because it's a leading cosine inverse of 0.8. Okay. So this is the one for the voltage regression you need to get, this is full load. So it's it will be the voltage, no load, which is the minus V full load over the V full load. So no load voltage is for the transformer is the voltage, you have to calculate this voltage here by getting, you know, this voltage, if it's in high voltage, it's 2000. 300 volt angle zero. And you know the current, it's here. We already calculated the current. Multiply by the R equivalent and the X equivalent or JX equivalent, you will get this voltage as a magnitude and angle. We need the angle. With the angle for the no load, you put it here. Full load, you can use the 2300. That's it. Okay, you get the voltage regula uh, regulation uh, efficiency. It's the P output over P input times 100%. Output, we, we already know the output because you know the uh, S and the power factor, for example, 0.8. So 0.8 times the this S, it will give you the output power, okay? However, to get the input, it's the output plus losses. What losses? First, copper losses, I square R equivalent. Second is the core losses V, this voltage that you got, squared over the RC. That's it. You have the efficiency. Efficiency for the transformer, high, like 98, 99%. So this is the first, actually first one. I added more like notes here. And if you check, you will find that both happened like the open circuit test and short circuit test at the rated at the high voltage side. And you have to, uh, you know, explain the things to make sure that the, um, uh, at least like the, in the exam, they, uh, they know that you understand the things, okay? For this one, you, of course, you can have the equations in the H sheet. Y for the open circuit, get the RC and XM. This short circuit, you get the R equivalent and X equivalent. Okay, you calculate and that's it. Oh. I think I, uh, here, this one is X equivalent here. Okay, uh, this is the short circuit. So X equivalent, R equivalent. This is open circuit. So RC and XM. All are referred to the high voltage. Okay. So 
this is the one. And then you can draw, get the voltage regression, V node minus V for load. We know the V for load, but you have to calculate the V no load. Okay. And calculate the voltage regression at this point. Okay. Efficiency output uh, or P output over input or output over output plus losses. Losses I square R plus uh, no load voltage over RC. No load voltage is squared over RC. Okay, you get the output. So you get the efficiency 98%. That's a very good number. Okay. Any question for this transformer problem? I think it's it's a, a kind of like straightforward problems for the transformer, like it's a default problem for the transformer or a typical one. For the DC, I included uh, two parts. The first one is uh, about the theory, commutator, what is the main purpose for the commutator and the comp compensation windings and the interpoles. We, we, you know, like we already discussed this during the slides or like the presentations, but we did it very quickly. So to do it like in more, you know, uh, detailed way. So commutator. What we use it in the generator, it's as we have like a mechanical rectifier, not like the power electronics, the rectifier of the power electronics, but you are trying to make the AC voltage to uh, DC voltage. Okay, this is for the generator to have DC voltage at your terminal. For the motor, you are trying to push because it's it's a, the, for the motor, it's the opposite, right? You have a DC source here, and you are trying using your segments to have like AC values inside. Okay. Once you have the AC values, you can, your machine can, uh, or your motor can rotate. Okay. So it's, it's reverse the DC voltage. It's, it's making actually the reverse of what the generator is doing. Okay. Until you have like um, producing torque, actually, like steady state torque. For the interpools, or sometimes we call it commutating pools. So there is a problem due to the armature action. And what the armature action is doing at the two, like between the two pools, you are expecting this point to have a zero flux. But due to the armature action, it's not. Because you are expecting that zero flux, zero voltage on the conductor here in between the two uh, poles, in the segments for the commutator, some of the segments you make like a short circuit using your brushes. When you do this, it will make a spark because you short circuit on something. You think that the voltage is zero, but it's actually not because of the armature action. So this one is making a lot of problems for the brushes, the lifetime for the brushes and segments and the commutator. So we put like something called the interpoles or something called the compensating windings. Both like the main thing is trying to eliminate or reduce the problem of the armature reaction, making the uh, flux or the not just the flux, the, the voltage induced in the conductors between the poles equals to zero. So when you make a short circuit on them, then it should be zero. This is the main thing. Okay. Any question? This problem, I, I believe we solved it something very close. It's um, 
DC shunt motor, which is again, it's like one of the typical problems for the DC. You have um, your DC, it's shunt, so you put this and then this. You have the voltage, 250 volt. Mm. At treated conditions, uh, driving a constant torque, a line current, so giving the line current here. This is for 40, uh, 41.6 volt. The resistance for the armature and the field. More losses, rotational losses, that's good. And then asking you for, you know, like the getting, for example, the armature resistance here, okay, and the output power here, for example, output power, because it's a motor, the torque, the efficiency. So you have this current, you have this voltage and you have this resistance. You can calculate the field the current from, you know, this current minus the field. It will give you like the armature with the armature current times this resistance. You minus this voltage drop from the uh, 250, you can get the E. Having the E, Multiply by the current, you can get the output power. Output power or the torque equals to the output power over the omega. How can I get the omega? It's the speed. This is speed because it's they said the, the value or, or everything, it's at the rated conditions. So we can use this speed, but this is in RPM. So you multiply by 2 pi over 60 to get it in omega, like omega radian per second. For the efficiency, it's the output over the input. What is the input? It's the power here. This voltage times this current. This is the input. Output is this power. Ignore any losses. They said ignore all the losses. And this is the, I believe, the first part. There is another part for the DC by, um, they said, without changing the torque. So you have the same torque. I believe we solved something very close to this. So without changing the torque, you have the same torque. Torque, it means E times I over omega you already have this torque because you didn't change it. The field resistance is decreased to this value. Remember the field resistance, RF, is reduced. So you can calculate the, the new field current here, IF, okay? And uh, because you change the field, you can, you can get the new field current. You know the field current before, or like first case, I will call the first one as the first case. This case is the second. So we have, this is the second. Uh, uh, tau is equal in both, so it, do it doesn't matter. But you will have this is as a first equation. The second equation is when you have the E, because you already have K phi omega, for the first case and second case. By the way, instead of using the flux, you can use the IF because they are proportional with each other and this is a ratio. So you have this is case one and this is case two. You already have the speed from the case one. You already have the current from the, feed the current from the case one and the case two already. We already divided the new resistance by the voltage. You can have another equation between E and omega 2. You already have E1, right? You already calculated. So this is the second equation. This, the third equation is 
related to you know like this this equation the v terminal equal i a r a plus e a this is the third equation three equations in three un unknowns e omega i a once you have the e omega the speed and the i a you can calculate all all of this armature current the line current because the line current will be armature plus the field uh, motor speed omega output power e times i a so you you will you can calculate every thing and let me show you quickly because i know the time is uh, running out so i will try to show you quickly the answer so this is the i, I like to have a sketch like from for the uh, you know the machine this is the armchair no rotational losses so this is the output you get the e and this is the output you get the torque and you get the efficiency 91 that's a good number then same torque you will have three equations in three unknowns. Solve, you get the current, you get the speed. You can, uh, I got the speed in uh, radian per second. You can multiply by 60 over 2 pi to get it in RPM. Okay. Then get the line current and output power. Okay. So for the last one, very quickly, is the synchronous. Synchronous motor. So this one is interesting, actually. You have, um, it's a uh, star connected, six poles. So this is number of poles. You have the full load voltage. It's a star connected, so divide this voltage by square root three if you need to use it. And they are giving the uh, phase, uh, per phase resist reactance, sorry. Armature resistance is neglected, so RA is zero. This is XS. They said at no load, your motor was running, so at no load. Okay. So this is what we have. Uh, it's a motor, so you put 600 over square root 3, angle 0. The motor was running, absorbing at no load, absorbing this power, 12 amps at power factor. So you can know the current, right? Uh, power factor leading, cosine inverse 0.05. So you have this and you have JXS, it's here. They ask it about excitation EMF to get the E and the power angle of the, so you can get the E and the power angle Delta. Of course you can get this one because the E magnitude uh, or uh, sorry, phasor equals to the voltage this voltage plus the current times J excess. You can calculate the E. Motor losses, this is interesting. The motor losses are actually the power, the total power, because they said that the, the motor is at no load. At no load, it means all the power, this times this power factor times the voltage Okay, they are, of course, make sure that this is line. So you multiply by square root three times this current times this. Power factor is all the power losses for the motors, for this motor. Because it's not connected to any load. Second one is actually a tricky one is if you if the mechanical load is increased 
okay, while keeping the excitation constant. So excitation constant, it means your magnitude for the E is constant, right? E magnitude is constant because E equals to, as a magnitude, K phi omega. Field is constant always. They didn't change it. Speed is constant. They didn't say anything about it changing the speed. So the magnitude for the E is constant. However, because you included some loads, the delta now is change it. By the way, the, the power angle here, it must be negative because this is a motor. Delta now will be larger than this value at no load because you will get more power from the source. Do you, you need to calculate the new power angle and new current and power input from this. So let's let's see what we have. <laughs> we have um, definitely definitely the voltage will be the same. Okay, you have J X S, and this is the current. They said something about unity power factor. So the angle for this current is zero similar to the voltage because it's a unity power factor. For the E, you have the magnitude of the E, but you, you don't have the angle. So the angle is unknown. XS, of course, we have it, 4.5. Magnitude of the current is unknown. I can write down the equation V equals E plus J X S I. I know that the magnitude of the current is unknown and the angle of the delta is unknown. Remember this equation is a complex and it's two equations actually. Two equations in two unknowns, delta and magnitude of the current. Once you have both of them, this is actually what they need. This one, and the new line current. The power input, of course, you can get it from this. You have the current, you have the voltage and the power factor, that's it. So once you have the, the uh, current, that's it. So let me quickly show you the answer and end our session. Sorry, but uh, so. This is the first part. You have the power factor uh, positive here, leading. Get the E, this is your E. And this is the delta, can you see it's negative? Excitation, EMF, and the power angle. Then the power losses is all the power, right? All the power is the power losses. Okay. Then to get the... Um, uh, a new uh, one, you have the same excitation, but delta is unknown and the current magnitude is unknown. Solve this equation and, sorry, solve this equation to get the current and the angle. Look at the angle, it will be 30 something. High, high compared to the small angle. We got it in the part A. You must pick the negative because it's motor. And this is the current, you can get, get the, the power at the end. That's it. Any question before we end this session? You have any question for the assignment too? Okay. No questions, so thank you. Thank you so much, and have a good evening. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Have a good night.